Welcome to Envision More. Here, we dig deep into the insights of first-generation wealth builders, unearthing stories of passion, resilience, and relentless vision. Your host is Wayne Wagner Jr., founder of Visionary Wealth Management. So sit back and dig in. It's time to Envision More. Welcome to the Envision More podcast. I am the host, Wayne Wagner, president of Visionary Wealth Management. I am joined by my beautiful bride, May, today, and uh, Trent Booth, president of Veritas Leadership Group. Today is a super special day. Uh, May and I have been uh, big fans of Gail and Michael Hyatt for a long time, and the the bio that we got on Michael and Gail is uh, Michael's reads like a who's who and amazing, uh, amazing accomplishments. And I think it's five time bestselling author, may probably more at this stage. Um, Gail is the woman behind the man. And Gail is a uh, mom to five daughters, uh, mom in law to three sons in law, 10 grandkids. Did I, did I get that all right? Yeah, that's uh, right. And, and behind, we know behind every successful guy who's got a, a, an impressive resume, there's a woman who's even more impressive. So, Gail and Michael, thank you so much for spending some time today here on Envision More. Happy to do it. Thanks for having us on. Yeah, thank you. So we're, it, we won't be, this won't be uh, rapid fire uh, questions from all the, the other three of us, but uh, we, it's more a conversation. Trent keeps us, uh, keeps the, the pace and the tone uh, directed and, and make sure that uh, we don't get too far down rabbit holes. And then he'll also be the guy who kind of gives us a time, gives us a, hey, a thumbs up at the end. Um, Gail and Michael, like, can we start at the beginning with you guys? Like, how'd you guys meet? You want to tell the story? All right, I'll tell it. Uh, we met at Baylor University in our senior year, and we went to the same church, and um, we were involved with a lot of activities in the church together, not to mention a few of the uh, activities on campus as well. We just kind of kept running into each other, and we started dating um, in October of our senior year. 77. 1977. And we were, we 76, wasn't it? Nope. Got married in 78. 78, you're right. Okay. Usually it's the woman that corrects the man on this stuff. <laughs> it's just I can't even remember life before Michael. So that's the uh, uh, so, good, re uh, good recovery. <laughs> Thanks. I'm impressed. <laughs> So anyway, we, uh, we we were engaged in October. We were, I'm sorry, we started dating in October. And then we were engaged in February of 78. And mm. then we were married in July of 78. So all in all, it was about a nine month, uh, you know, courtship, whatever. And uh, once we knew, we knew and we were off to the races. There's a little bit of nuance to that, though, because... I knew literally the first time I met her, which is really weird because I had kind of sworn off dating and was trying to be really serious about developing and cultivating my faith and being focused on my studies. And so that, that worked great right up until I met her. And I was at a church function. There was a, like a pizza party for the students. And I saw her across the room. And I, it was almost like this voice said to me, it didn't, but it was like, almost like this voice said, that's the future Mrs. Hyatt. Mm. And I fell head over heels. And then when we got engaged, she broke the engagement off twice. Oh. And yep. in I nine sold, months, I, I sold her back into it, which is when I first <laughs> learned that I had some ability in sales. Love it. <laughs> Love it. Yep. That's amazing. <clears throat> And oh, how yeah. many years total is that now? They're trying to do math. That's 46, almost 46. Wow. Guys. That's, that's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So, May came home from college early because I was getting cold feet. So yeah. we had a similar uh, track of breaking up and getting back together, yeah. especially after the, the hardest one was after we had, were engaged. <laughs> so, yeah. but yeah, yeah. I, I think that when you recognize the seriousness of the decision, yeah. For me, that's, you know, I had no um, contingency plan if it didn't work. I wasn't, I really wasn't open to divorce. My parents had a mm -hmm. great marriage. All my 
uh, relatives all had great marriages. So divorce was not a part of my upbringing anywhere. And so for me, this was forever. And so I was just scared yeah. to death to think about committing to something forever. But I did. Yeah, that is such a, that is such a much better excuse than I gave May. <laughs> I, I made the horrible mistake at one point saying, yeah, uh, I was joking, but I said, <laughs> I just wanted to see if you were the best I could get. Oh, we are married 30 oh. years this year. And that one hangs over my head more than any other mistake. You, you, I you have can't made. unring the bell, Wayne. That's, that's no. how that one works. You know, <laughs> no, I man. love your story. It's, it's actually similar to Christy and I. We met March 12th and we were married November 6th the same year. So our first Christmas together was married. Our first wow. Valentine's Day wow, was wow. married. And it's 25 wow. years that we're starting okay. to celebrate now. It's uh, good for November. you. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Well, that's a great story. Now, what did Michael? What was what was your grand plan? You're going to you graduate from college, so you started dating at the beginning of your senior year. You graduate from college, and did you walk into Wall Street and they just gave you handed you a CEO job, or like how? What, what was the plan for for family and career at that stage? Gail's dad was a colonel in the Air Force, and he worked at the Pentagon. Oh, wow. And I remember calling him. And asking for her hand in marriage. Now, again, I'm, a, I'm still a student when this happens. <laughs> and he says, we're excited about the prospect of you coming into our family. But what are you going to do to make a living? I was a philosophy major. Oh. And I intended to go to seminary and be in the ministry. But that's a whole other thing. So after I got really serious about her, I thought, I got to find a way to make a living here. And... At that point, I took a part-time job working for a small book publishing company in Waco, Texas, hmm. and fell in love with books, fell in love with the book publishing industry. And so that's where I spent the bulk of, of my career. And I, I started in sales, then I got into marketing, then I got into editorial, and eventually wound up as the CEO of Thomas Nelson Publishers in Nashville. This was like, you know, 25 years later. And at the time, that was the seventh largest publisher in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and the largest faith-based publisher in the world. Mm -hmm. And so that was an amazing, amazing experience. And I had the privilege or the misfortune of leading the company through the Great Recession, which mm -hmm. was really challenging. But I learned some important leadership lessons uh, through that. But then we sold the company. It was public when I became the CEO. And then we sold it to HarperCollins in 2011. Took a year for that transaction to be approved by the government. And so I stayed on as the chairman for that year and then started this company full focus in 2011 also, kind of as a doing that part time and Thomas Nelson kind of part time too. Gotcha. Wow. And what is what is full focus? What is um, what's the, the, the crux of the of the business? Well, the thing that our business is committed to is helping people get what we call the double win which is to win at work and to succeed at life. And one of the things that I realized, in fact, I'm gonna to have to tell you a story to kind of get to this. But back in about 2000, I got a promotion. I was at Thomas Nelson at the time, was not the CEO, was an assistant general manager of one of the 14 divisions in the company. My boss suddenly resigned and they made me the new general manager of that division. And what I didn't realize at the time was that that division was number 14, out of 14 in revenue growth and profitability. We were shrinking mm. and we'd lost money the previous year. So the CEO asked me, how long is it going to take you to turn it around? I pulled a number out of the air. I said about three years. What I didn't realize initially was that I was in the best possible position I could be in because I couldn't screw it up. We're already 14 out of 14. I could only right. make it better. Right. So I, I came up with a vision for what I wanted the company or that division to do. Shared it with my team. We rolled up our sleeves, got busy, but we were working like 80 hours a week, every night, a lot of weekends, no vacations, but we turned that division around in a year and a half rather than three years. And we went from number 14 to number one, fastest growing division, most profitable, all that. I got the biggest bonus check I'd ever gotten in my career. It was more than my annual salary. Mm. Wow. So I took it home just knowing that Gail, being the cheerleader and the, the enthusiast that she is, was going to be so excited. But she really wasn't. When I showed her the check, she just kind of looked at me and she said, we need to talk. 
Mm. Like those are the most fearsome words as a spouse you can ever hear. Yeah. So we went into the den, sat down, and she began to tear up. And she said to me, she said, look, first of all, I'm super grateful for everything you do for our family. But I got to be honest, you're never home. Mm-hmm. And even when you are, your head's somewhere else. You're not fully present. And your daughters need you now more than ever. We have five daughters. Hmm. And then she began to cry. And she said, if I'm honest, I feel like a single mom. Hmm. Well, that I was kind of confronted with what I now call the possible choice. Mm-hmm. You know, I could either win at work and continue to lead and kill it in my career. Or I could spend time with the family and kind of throttle back my ambition. Mm -hmm. And neither of those sounded tenable. So I kept wondering, is there a third option where somehow you could grow the business, scale the business, but at the same time, attend to the things that are really the ultimate priorities? You know, God, Mm -hmm. family, friends, hobbies, all those other things. I didn't want to neglect any of those. Health. Mm -hmm. So that that sent me on a quest, and full focus is the result of that. As a company, we're committed to helping people get the double win. The biggest product that we have is a physical planner product called the Full Focus Planner. And it basically, we designed that, even though I'm a super digital, geeky tech guy, I realized that there's so much distraction in the digital world that I needed a place to kind of organize my thinking and keep me on track. And so that became... The Full Focus Planner, we sold about a million and a half copies of that. It's the mm-hmm. heart of our company. We have a lot, of, a lot of online courses, live events, other things that we do as well. That's incredible. So that's this is kind of version 2.0 all the way up through to the top of the, the publishing industry and then really coming to coming to a, a decision point, an inflection point where you've got to make a decision. Gail, how, how hard was it to have that conversation? Um, cause that, that had to be, it, that didn't happen overnight. It, it, it was, you know, and you waited, you, you blessedly waited until he was on a high. And so, so when you let him down, it was like, he was holding a check that he felt pretty good about himself. <laughs> um, that, that was, that was a blessing uh, at speaking as a, as a husband who's had some of those conversations, yeah. but, uh, how, how hard was that discussion? Well, it was incredibly hard, honestly. Um, I think that the way I saw my role as the wife of a driven business person, entrepreneur, I mean, even though he worked for a big company, his his way of being was still entrepreneurial, trying new things, experimenting, um, all that. So I would have considered myself to be married to an entrepreneur because he was always trying new things. and mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> And so because of that, my number one goal was to give him the message that you have what it takes because he, because he took a lot of risks. He did a lot of things that were risky and I wanted him to know that I was behind him. And um, I believed he was completely capable of accomplishing the goals that he wanted to accomplish. But what happened was um, because of his drivenness, um, he neglected the family. And that was really, for a while, that was okay with me. I was like, okay, but it always seemed to be temporary. Well, as soon as I get through this, then we'll, we'll do such and such. Or as soon as I reach this goal, then that means that I'll be, you know, free and I can do more with the family or whatever. There was, it was always this temporary situation. And after a while that just got really old. And I was like, okay, I've had enough of the temporary excuses. Like this is a problem and we need to, we need to address it. I don't think I had planned to talk to him that day. It just was like, that was the culmination. Like, I don't want more big checks. I don't care if I live in a cardboard box under a bridge. I want you and I want you with our kids. Yeah. Yeah. So. How, how old were your kids at around at about this time? What year was that? That would have been about 2002. Okay. So Megan was born in 80. So 22. So 22. Okay. Yeah. All the way down to 12. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, really they're... pretty critical time. Yeah. 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 Mission critical time for those girls for sure. So that's, so what, 
Michael, how'd you come out of that? How did you, you know, you know, did you go out the next day and quit your job and and then, you know, just stay home and live off that that, that bonus check until it ran out and then go start selling books on the, on the corner? Yeah, I was, um, I was really frustrated mm-hmm. because I couldn't see a way out because I was enjoying the success at work and I had a team there that was now counting on me and my boss, the CEO was counting on me. And so I felt, and it, and it was work that I loved. I felt so, so much purpose in it. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, here was my family. And by that time, by the time Gail had this talk with me, I really saw it. And so I felt like I was on the horns of a dilemma. Mm-hmm. Right. And so what I did was I talked to one of my authors at the time was John Maxwell. And I said never, to John, never heard of him. <laughs> I, I said to him, I've got a lot of John stories, but I him, John, I feel like I need an executive coach. And I didn't really go into a lot of detail, but he connected me with Daniel Harkavy at Building Champions. And they're a executive coaching company. And Daniel and I have since become great friends. We wrote a book together on life planning called Living Forward. But the very first thing he did was he said, he, he ultimately got me to create a life plan, which was enormously helpful because that changed the vision for my life and made it much more expansive. Mm-hmm. And I ans- asked the question, what would have to be true for me to continue to excel at work, but not at the expense of my family and mm-hmm. my health? Yeah. So that was really good. But one of the first things he did that was enormously helpful is he said, you seem like a guy with no boundaries on work. And I went, yeah. And he said, tell me if this is true. You know, you work all day and you think, you know, in the middle of the afternoon, if you don't get this project done, no problem. You'll just go home, grab a quick meal with the family, prop open your laptop and get back to work. And he said, my guess is you're probably the guy that on a vacation, if you take vacations, which wasn't very often, but if you take them, you're the guy that gets up early before the family, cranks through a bunch of email, and you're pretty much connected all day. And I said, that's true. And he said, what about weekends? He said, you take weekends off. He said, my guess is you're probably working Saturday morning, maybe Sunday afternoon. And I said, yeah, it's true. He said, you need to put hard boundaries around work. He said, and counterintuitively, it's gonna make you more productive. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit like, you know how productive you are on the Friday before you leave on a two week vacation. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like unbelievable how much stuff you can get accomplished because you're focused, you've got a set, you know, a to do mm-hmm. list that's got to get done and you're up against a deadline. Mm-hmm. So he had me establish some boundaries. So I agreed with him that um, I would quit work at six o'clock, which is kind of funny thinking about it now because I quit a lot earlier than that now, but quit at six o'clock. And he got me to agree not to work weekends at all and not to work on vacations. And so I agreed to that kind of reluctantly because I didn't know if it was possible. But then he said something that got my attention and did make it possible. He said, well, if you're committed to that, then you probably won't mind if I call Gail occasionally and check in and see how you're doing. <laughs> and he did. And that kept me accountable in a, in a profound way and kind of changed everything. Yeah. Yeah. This is really good. I, you know, I can imagine just the fear that Gail had coming to you, right, to address it. And then as a wife, like Wayne is also very driven. He's an entrepreneur. He has a million things going on. Sometimes we have little conversations about like, what? We, we bought a what? A trailer? For how much? You know? <laughs> and so I find out about things after the fact. Um but that is who he is. So there's always this fine line between bringing things like that to him and also deflating him. Like, I don't want to deflate him and I don't want him to feel trapped, but you know, he needs to know what the crux of the matter is right now. And um, so I, I appreciate the fact that Michael, you were very humble and that you sought to figure it out and you sought counsel. Um, and that's very important that, you know, we can't do all these things on our own. We need someone else speaking into our life and, what a great resource you had. Well, I, I think my overarching framework for life is stewardship. Mm-hmm. And and I do feel an ultimate accountability to God. 
-hmm. And I do feel that in my life, that everything I have, whether it's material possessions or my values or whatever it is, relationships, relationships, that Mm -hmm. I'm a steward of those relationships. And I think I I realized in that moment that I wasn't being a very good steward, that, Mm -hmm. yeah, I was being a great steward in one one domain of life. Mm -hmm. But one of the things we teach at Full Focus is that there are actually nine domains and work is just one of them. And, Mm -hmm. And certainly, you know, I think as professionals, you know, we want to seek to, you know, really be the best version of ourselves at work and really accomplish stuff and find our meaning and purpose there. But it's one domain. And the problem is, if you hit turbulence in that domain, and the other domains you haven't invested in, it's like, and like as a financial advisor, if you have a client that goes all in on one stock, and they don't have a balanced portfolio, haven't balanced their assets, and that stock goes south, they're in a world of hurt. Yeah. And that's kind of how I was. Yeah. Michael, you've already referenced, um, or at least May was already referencing your humility. And I love it on your, your LinkedIn profile. You start with, I'm a mentor. I mean, all the success that you've had and you still see yourself as mentoring, which in my mind, at least means that you're continuing to have conversations like this one-on-one with people. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm curious how much some of those failure or Valley type moments has informed not only your, your coaching style or your mentoring style, but also how much being a girl dad and uh, you know, how much that would have changed your view of, of the world over the years has influenced uh, how you lead today. Well, I essentially have a business model that where I've monetized my failures <laughs> and my mistakes. And so I feel like everything that happens to us, happens for a reason, but mostly for other people. Mm -hmm. So that if I go through something, I know somebody else is going through it. Like I I do private coaching one day a week. And so I've got about eight clients that uh, I talk with every other week. And in those conversations, I think one of the, the biggest values I bring is that I can normalize their experience. Sure. So if they're stressed out or anxious, or they're fearful that they're not gonna hit a goal and they have nobody else to talk to. You know, I usually have some story where I felt the same way. Mm-hmm. And, and people can find comfort in that. You know, and then, you know, ultimately I figured it out and that becomes a shortcut for them because they'll make their own mistakes but they don't have to make my mistakes. But I kind of feel like I'm in this season of life and I got this from my friend, Ian Cron. He said, really your mission in this season of your life is to grow fruit on other people's streets. Hmm. And so that's where the mentoring idea comes from is that I just want to help grow fruit on other people's streets. However, I can help. That's really good. That's amazing. It doesn't, doesn't look like you're winding down either. So, you know, when, when Wayne and I talk about, I hope I'm still doing one-on-one coaching into my seventies, Lord willing, what's this, what's the plan for you? Is this, uh, is this going to keep going? Yes. I, you know, I think retirement's one of those tricky things. And I think it can be a good thing. I think it can be a bad thing. But I think that, again, under the umbrella of stewardship, I feel like if I'm still alive, that's because my greatest purpose has not yet been fulfilled. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, Dan Sullivan says, always make your future bigger than your past. And I have a lot of friends they retire and all they talk about is the glory days. Mm. They don't have a future to look forward to. And so I always want to be thinking about the future. Futuristic is, I think, my sixth strength on the strengths finders. Mm. <laughs> and it used to be in the top five, but I re- took it recently and it slipped to six. But still, I think a lot about the future. Mm-hmm. And I think coaching, particularly leading masterminds, pouring into people's lives, is something, you know, I pray that I can do as long as God gives me breath. Hmm. Man, that is, uh, when speaking as a financial advisor, we talk about compounded growth. And the reason we tell people to invest early is because the compounding that happens over time, you know, if you put a thousand dollars away and you get six multiplications instead of five, you know, a thousand becomes 2000, 4000, 8000, 16000, 32000. And then 
64,000, 54 or 50% of all the growth happened in that last compound, uh, compound event. And we live in a economy society that's kind of this up or out, um, has an up or out mentality within the corporate world. And yet, Michael and Gail, you, you all are past age 60. I won't put a number on it, but past age 60 at this stage. And, um, you know, it, it's where mo many people are thinking about winding down, but your mindset is, hey, no, there, there's, let's transition from growing fruit on our tree to growing fruit on other people's trees. And that's, that's an act of stewardship, but it's, it's, it's really a, it's an exponential compounding that you have the, the potential to do when we, when we approach this stage of life with that kind of a mindset versus how much time can I get off? Well, I'm just going to go play golf and walk beaches the rest of my, my rest of my days, or how little can I, can I, can I get to my number and just be done? Um, you're, you're basically, you're, you're, you're showing us the, the, you know, not a generation down, a half a step, half a generation down, you're showing us, um, you know, a, a different way of thinking about those years of financial independence. So, yeah, and I think, you know, there are different ways to think about this, but I think another big shift happened for me in thinking about going from an operator to sort of an owner mentality. And so I made my daughter, my oldest daughter, Megan, the CEO of the company three years ago, because I did want to transition and I do like playing golf and I do like fishing and we have a lake house and we were just there for four days. And, you know, we love that kind of stuff. And I love spending time with the family. So to me, it's not like either or, right? but it's a different, it's different work that I'm doing now. And I think I came to the realization as I was contemplating making Megan the CEO of the company, I thought, you know, so much talk about legacy is vanity mm -hmm. because if you think about it, you know, we're going to be lucky to be remembered in mm -hmm. 25 or 50 years. Yeah. If I were to die today, you know, people would talk for a while. Family would talk for a while. Yeah. But I never knew my great grandparents. I, I could even tell you their names. Right. And yeah. so we're going to be forgotten. However, what we can do is leave an impact on people that ripples through eternity, yeah. even though we won't get the credit for it. And others will build upon you know, our initial foundation. And that's yeah. fine. We just play our part. And, you know, I just, I sort of disabused myself with the notion that I'm going to be so famous that people will remember me in a hundred years. Yeah. Very unlikely. I just had this conversation with a client this week. He and his wife are integrally involved in a school for at-risk girls in Kenya mm. where they teach life skills and these are generally single moms, often, you know, frequently a family member is, is the father. Um, so it's, it's broken situations. Um, and they bring them in and they, they put a roof over their head and they care for their kids and they teach them life skills over a course of, of a couple of years. And he and I were just talking about the fact that, you know, 100 years from now, no one will know us. If we put our name on a building 100 years from now, they're tearing the building down for crying out loud. Yeah. But when we can do something... For someone who can't re who can't pay it back, this isn't a quid pro quo. This is I'm doing something for someone else. We have the potential to create echoes in eternity, and when when we do that and 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 give to others and do something for someone who can't re return the favor, and I, I think you know Michael and Gail the, the the mentoring side, the the being an example, the coaching side that you're you having a mindset to pour into others and bear fruit on other people's trees is that is something that will echo in eternity for sure. That's amazing. So that's our prayer. Yeah. Gail, how has, uh, you know, it, mom to five daughters. So that's, uh, so you've got the blessing, uh, Trent and may and I all had to raise it, to raise one son. And we're, and we're kind of blessed because the, the boys are best friends. So they're, 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 and they're doing life together and they're growing and they're becoming best versions of themselves. They're, they're, they're amazing. But, um, girl mom is that, that like, how do you do five girls under one roof? Like, well, six women under one roof, but five girls raise it. And, and with a, with an absentee husband until they're in their teens. 
Well, we joke that that Michael suffers from estrogen poisoning, so that's <laughs> one, of the, one of the things. Um, you know, it's interesting with with raising girls. Um, I do have five grandsons now, so that's pretty fun. And they all live, all our grandkids live within five minutes of us. Oh, wow. So that's they're amazing. over all the time. In fact, we've got two that are living with us right now while their house is undergoing some construction. So, okay. Um, but anyway, with the girls, <clears throat> I think that um, one of the things that that we've always done and that I feel like I've done is um, be great listeners. You, you know, girls are talkers and he's learned a lot of listening skills. Uh, he's learned the, the, the nod and, you know, mm, humming, nodding, you know, <laughs> technique that's really effective with girls. Oh mm, yeah. Mm, wow. Tell and then more. when that conversation <laughs> over, it's like, dad, you're the best. Thanks. You know, <laughs> I didn't even say two words. Um, <laughs> But anyway, I think that what I am, what I'm loving right now is the fact that honestly, my girls, every one of them is a, is one of my very best friends. Mm -hmm. Like we, my youngest is now, uh, 32, 30, 33, no, 30. Yeah. 33. Yeah. She'll be 34 this year, I think. Um, and so then my oldest is 44. So, um, 43, 44, it's a moving target. Um, so they're, they're adults, they have families, uh, some of them are single, but they're just, um, we just see each other as friends and confidants. And, um, that, I think that is possible because of how we affirm them all along the way. We didn't try to push them into anything, um, that we wanted them to be or do or accomplish. We just, we just try to nurture what was there naturally and mm. love them and encourage them and be there for them when they'd make bad decisions. We wanted to be the soft place for them to land. So we kind of mm -hmm. let them experience the consequences of some of their poor choices when they were younger. And so, um, I don't know. I just, I can't think of anything more wonderful than having daughters. It's just been mm -hmm. fantastic. That listening thing, too, doesn't come natural to me, just to be clear, mm -hmm. because I'm a recovering CEO. Mm -hmm. And so I'm used to, and I was trained by years, people bring me a problem, I solve it. Yeah. You know, let's yep. get the solution. And so uh, somebody told us one time, they said, you know, one good thing to say when somebody comes to talk to you <laughs> is do you need a repairman or a trash can. Mm hmm. You know, and so, so sometimes we'll start the conversation, Dad. I just need a trash can. I'm, I'm not looking for you to fix it. Yeah, that's, that's great. Cool. Yeah, yeah, and that's helpful. It, it took me. Say. It took me 20 years of marriage to ask the question: Are you just? Do you just need me to listen, or do you want me to? Do you, do you want a solution? Or do you want me to fix it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. our daughter, our daughter likes to talk at like um, 6 30, 7 o'clock in the morning. And we are not morning people, but it is very hard to listen at 6 30 yeah. in the morning. Yeah. So she gets yeah. a lot of mm, mm, mm. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> and then, a, snor and then younger, a snore. When they're younger, a couple uh, times when it's great to talk is when you're in the car because mm -hmm. you're looking at the street, you're looking straight ahead, you're not looking at each other. It's kind of a, a safe place to mm -hmm. be vulnerable. The other is on is at night on the bed, you know, sitting on the edge of the bed with the lights out and they're talking and they're not, again, a lot of that real deep conversations or more vulnerable conversations happen when, you, when they don't have to look at you in the eyes. And mm -hmm. so, um, or going on a walk, if that's an option, so those mm -hmm. are some really good things. I do want to say one other thing about our adult daughters that um, kind of may play into the theme of this podcast is that they're each in their own way entrepreneurs, and they are very successful business women, each one of them. And mm -hmm. that's, um, you know, a beautiful thing. It's also a challenging thing. I think for women to be really successful financially is um, it's hard. It's hard for the, the two that are single 
um, to find a man who is on their level, uh, mm -hmm. both financially and intellectually and spiritually and character, uh, character and all of that. Mm -hmm. So, um, but we're extremely proud of them and they've had their ups and downs too, but um, they're, mm -hmm. they're very successful in their own right. Can, can we go back and then go forward? So, so Michael comes at his role professionally like an entrepreneur. He's working in a big corporation, but he's functioning like an entrepreneur. You now have are raising or have raised five entrepreneurs. The generation or two before the two of you, were your parents entrepreneurs, business owners? That's a great question. That is a good question. You go well, first. Okay. Yes. My dad was out of necessity. So my dad got really injured in the Korean War. Hmm. And he was in a coma for six months. He took some shrapnel to the head and always walked with a severe limp. Now he's in a wheelchair. He's 90 years old. <laughs> but, but when he came back from Korea, there was not the same kind of sensitivity sensitivity or empathy toward handicapped people. There was no provision made for them. Yeah. And he just couldn't get hired. Nobody wanted to hire this handicapped guy. And mm -hmm. so out of necessity, he had to become an entrepreneur. And I saw these wild swings financially, mm -hmm. you know, where there were times when we were destitute, although when you're growing up in the family, I don't didn't perceive it as destitute, but right. we were lower, lower middle class. Yeah. And I remember one, one time, one of my dad's businesses failed. And so I have a little brother and a younger sister. And so my brother and I, we had to go out and cut firewood in order to help the family just put food on the table. Mm -hmm. And I didn't resent it. I just didn't, yeah, you know, you kind of normalize it because in your family, yeah, we just pitch in and help. But yeah. my dad was always so encouraging to me to try different things. You know, I tried a lawn mowing business that lasted maybe a week. Uh, <laughs> you know, I tried to sell greeting cards door to door. I sold cable television door to door. And my dad was always there cheering me on. My dad was the first guy that ever said to me, you know, son, sales is just a numbers game. You know, you have to get so many no's before you're gonna get a yes. Mm -hmm. And it, he didn't use this word, but it's just like an algorithm. And once you figure that out, all you gotta do is just work the system and you'll be successful. Yeah. He paid me to read um, The Power of Positive Thinking. Mm. Paid me like 20 bucks to read that book. And so um, so I, I did grow up with an entrepreneurial father who was a huge encouragement. But in my teen years, and again, PTSD wasn't a thing back then. He never processed what happened to him in the war. Right. Right. So he started drinking. It was the only way he knew to medicate. Mm. And so I, in my teenage years, my dad was an alcoholic and that was really, really hard. But it also gave me drive because I just said to myself, I don't want to end up an alcoholic and I'm going to do everything I can to be successful and not be in this situation. Yeah. I take, uh, and Gail, we're going to come back to you in a second. I, I take Simon Sinek's work and, and, and kind of talk about the why as being the negative. What am I running from? What do I not want to become? And then the infinite game is what is the world I'm trying to create? What is, and so I don't think he quite puts it that way, but that's how I think about the why versus the infinite game. And that's, we, you're, you're absolutely right, uh, Michael. We need, we all need those negatives. And, and it sounds like maybe there's a, a, a redeemed relationship with dad today. Yes. Um, and, and, and that's, that's an amazing, that's an, that's an amazing testament to God's grace to us, right? When there's been brokenness in a, in a relationship with a, with a parent, or there's been, you know, system, some systemic besetting issue. And then over time, those things that we don't rewrite the past, we don't cover them up, but we can overcome them and preserve the relationship and restore the relationship over time. And that's, that's a, a gift of God. Yeah. I mean, there were decades that I was just angry. Yeah. And, you know, frankly, it was through some therapy and mm -hmm. maturity that I found some empathy and realized that, I mean, what were his choices? Mm -hmm. right. You know, and I'm not yeah. saying he's not responsible, but yeah. I'm not sure I would have done anything different. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, if you were, if you had PTSD and that wasn't a thing and, a lot of yeah. pain. and you're just miserable and a lot of pain, yeah. chronic yeah. pain, you're going to self-medicate somehow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my, my own story is my dad had a horrible temper when we were young mm. and, um, but in retrospect, he was first generation to go to college in his family. He was the only person in his family to ever graduate college. Um, he went to Bible college at a time where Christian education was coming in vogue and he became a Christian school teacher and, a, and the administrator of, of a Christian school. And so he finds himself married in upstate New York, getting paid $50 a week to run a Christian school and having to pump gas at the Agway gas station, not respected in church, not respected in community, not respected by the students in the school, um, certainly not respected by the people he's pumping gas for on the weekends to make ends meet. And so when he would come home and then we, us kids wouldn't give him the respect he perceived that he deserved, that's where the anger got triggered. And so, you know, years later, lots of therapy for him and for me, you know, we can look back on those times and I can look back on those times like you, Michael, and say, how else, how would I have responded differently in that set of circumstances? You know, I, I did everything I was supposed to do. I, I did everything my Christian faith said to do. I went to Bible college. I pursued this thing, you know, I'm in Christian ministry. I'm, I'm serving God. I'm serving the church. I'm serving others. My whole life is serving somebody else. And yet, like, I'm not respected and I don't, and I'm having to pump gas to pay my mortgage. Hmm. And, you know, so it's, it's, you know, in retrospect, you know, empathy comes, like you said, sometimes after decades and, and, and lots of therapy. So, Gail, let's circle back to you. What, what, an entrepreneurial mindset or, you know, in, in your parents or grandparents? Nothing could be further from the, from the truth for me. Okay. So uh, I came from a military family. Um, my, my dad was a very highly respected man in the air force. He was the executive sec. He was the secretary. Executive secretary to the chairman of the joint chiefs of staff at the Pentagon. Yeah. So wow. he was in, this is during the Vietnam years and he was in, in the Cuban missile crisis and all of that. He was mm. involved, uh, with the joint chiefs of staff, uh, as the executive secretary to the chairman. And um, so Full kernel. I, I grew up with four older brothers who uh, three of them went into the military. Uh-oh. We're frozen. Um, say that again. We, we got frozen there. there for a second. Oh, okay. Uh, three, so three, they, older, three older brothers. Yeah. Uh, I have four, four older brothers, three of whom were in the military. Um, and so I grew up with a very secure uh, life. My parents were both Christians. And so spiritually. Your video is frozen again. I'm sorry. Yeah. And we can't hear you. Huh. I think maybe, uh, oh. yep, there it is. Okay. Okay. Got you back. Um, Got you back. <laughs> there we we go. Start back with the four older brothers again. <laughs> okay. So uh, I have four older brothers. I'm the only girl, the baby of the family, but the three of them went into the military. Um, but my life was very secure, very, very consistent. Um, we never had to worry about money. We never had to, we never, my parents were committed Christians. They had a great marriage. I never had to worry about family conflict. So mm -hmm. it was a, it was pretty much of an idyllic uh, upbringing on my part, but I didn't know, like when I found out that my next door neighbor worked for a car company, he worked for Ford Motor Company as a salesman. I just thought, who does, you mean, real people actually work at these places and they, <laughs> they sell things. Like I, I just, I just didn't put two and two together. So mm -hmm. I couldn't have had, I had zero experience with the business world, with entrepreneurs, with anything like that. So Michael kind of eased you into it by staying in a corporate structure, but just functioning entrepreneurially. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had some entrepreneurial seizures throughout my <laughs> career. I started a publishing company 
back in 1986 that went gangbusters for five years and then we went broke. Mm. And, but the thing that is, is amazing about Gail's background, like I've always been, money's always been a trigger for me, you know, and it's taken a lot of therapy to kind of get past that. Mm -hmm. And so the slightest thing, even today, you know, a hiccup financially, you know, I still have that initial kind of trauma response. Mm -hmm. Gail has none of that. So if there's ever an issue, she's just like, it'll be fine. I mean, it's mm -hmm. really almost like it's amazing. a Pollyanna kind of attitude, but it's it served our marriage really well. He's Steady. like, the, I'm yeah. like the volleyball and she's the tether pole. <laughs> And I do think that that um, we were able to pass that on to our kids to a to a large degree. Mm -hmm. um, they they kind of got the best of both of us, mm -hmm. so they have that uh, excitement and thrill of being an entrepreneur and trying out new things and and kind of living in that tension. But then they also seem to have not a real fear of the future either. You know they. They realize, okay, if this doesn't work, then it's if not this, something better. So it's just not, or or go to the worst case scenario. Yeah, I can handle that. That's not a yeah. big deal. You know, we have to sell our house and move into an apartment. That's okay. It's not. It's just temporary anyway. You know. So it's just. I just think they kind of got the most best of both of us on that. Yeah. I think I think you and my wife have got shared DNA, Gail. <laughs> Awesome. I, I, I seriously think you do That's because great. it is our darkest moments. I'd be up pacing the floor in the middle of the night, you know, and she'd be like, it's going to work out. It's going, but it's going to work out because I make it work out. And <laughs> <laughs> what, yeah. why, my why, hand. Why, why, when's the last time, when's the last time you prayed about this, Wayne? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh. So one of the, one of the things that um, is kind of occurring to me right now is that, you know, we're talking about legacy and um, leaving stuff to our kids. My dad was a pastor, but he, um, I think this, my freshman year of college, I saw the FAFSA form and I think he made $10,000 that year. Wow. And I was shocked because at that time, my tuition for college was 13000 a year and he was contributing to my college education. I wasn't doing it 100% on my own. They were contributing and I was just very shocked by that. But my dad had to be entrepreneurial in his thoughts. So he um, you know, bought an old car dealership. He turned it into a, a mechanical shop. He was always very skilled at mechanics and he just decided he was gonna do that. And then that parlayed into owning multiple rental units um, and when my dad actually retired from the pastorate, we actually lived in one of those rental units for a while until, you know, he kind of got his feet under him and decided, you know, what was next. And he was a big fan of Robert Schuler, So I know all about that positive thinking. He listened to him every Sunday morning. And even though I wasn't paying attention, you know, as a teenager, I heard it. And um, my kids get mad at me about always seeing the positive side of things. And they're like, can you just let me, you know, <laughs> rest in the fact that there's all this negativity, mom. I just want to, I want to talk about the negative. And I'm like, no, no you've got to see the positive in it too. And, um, and so there's some of that. I, I guess I always take, what is the worst possible thing that could happen right now or in this situation? And I address it and I'm yeah. like, I would be okay with that. We would be exactly. together. We would survive it. We would get through it. So it's it's not that bad way and go back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are sisters from a different mother. <laughs> so, I mean, the legacy that was left to me from my father, even not even knowing it, just as he is, you know, making a go at running his own businesses and I'm watching, you know, so the legacy in that. I, I bring that to the family now and I, it's taken me a while. You know, we went through the whole family brand process with Chris and Melissa Smith. And um, we always, we were kind of like stuck a little bit and looking back into our ancestry and finding someone who we could appreciate and hold up. And we were like, really, there's not anybody in our family like that, you know, and it was hard for us, but I think through the process of it, we're realizing that we picked up so much, at least I picked up so much from my dad, just watching him basically survive. Mm. And um, so that your daughters, all very entre entrepreneurial minded, they've all watched you, 
you know, make that turn from CEO to business owner and um, what that has done for your family. They've witnessed that. They didn't, they've experienced the benefits of that. So they want that for their own. Yeah. Really so good point. Be, um, mm -hmm. So I'd love to turn our discussion for a little bit here towards some of the full focus planners and, and life focus products that you guys have there. And part of that's just from a, a curious uh, curiosity on my part, because I've been journaling for 31 ish years and love the old school analog, like the paper. It's the only time I'm writing these days. The only time I'm writing it certainly cursive would be in that journal, but I, I would love to hear some of the origin story behind the full focus planner. Uh, and part of that is because I was researching my own, and then I saw yours and decided to abandon because it's already it exists. Everything I wanted is already a thing, and I'm so excited to do the deep dive and get the light focus products as well. So, could you walk us through a little bit about how you started sure. that uh, the planner? Yeah, so I started teaching a course back in about 2013, I think, called Five Days to Your Best Year Ever, and that became a book called Your Best Year Ever, which became a bestseller, Wall Street Journal, USA Today bestseller. And it was really not a philosophy of goal setting, but it was the science behind goal achievement. Those are two different things. A lot of people set goals, but achieving goals are something else entirely. So I wrote that book and I've always been a goal setter. Even in college, I was setting goals. And then I wrote a book that was kind of a companion book almost on productivity called Free to Focus. And so my team got together and they said, what kind of tool could we create that would enable people to pursue goal achievement and be highly productive? And so one of the first things, we were actually reading a book at the time as a team called The Revenge of Analog. And it was how vital records are making a comeback, board games are making a comeback, physical books are making a comeback, all of that. And so my team said, look, I know you're very geeky and you love technology, but let's be honest, don't you sort of sometimes lose your place and get distracted? I said, mm -hmm. absolutely. So he said, what if we create a physical planner? And I had been one of those people, I used the Franklin planner, Franklin Covey planner, daytimer, daytimer seven star diary, all these planners going back generations. I was always the guy that had that, even in college. Mm -hmm. You know, I was the guy that had the planner. And so we came up with a full focus planner. And I said to my team, I said, of course, I'm coming out of the book publishing world. And I know the downsides of that, which is the worst thing is you print a bunch of inventory. And now you have an illiquid asset that you have to sell for pennies on the dollar. Mm -hmm. so I said, if you guys are confident that you can sell 10,000 copies, I'll fund it. And they said, oh, yeah, we think we can. And I thought, uh, maybe 50% chance. <laughs> but I wrote the check because they were very enthusiastic about it. Well, that we sold 10,000 copies like in the first six weeks. Wow. And now we sold about a million and a half. And we've got tens and tens of thousands of customers. And, we, and it's a quarterly planner. So people sign up for a subscription. Hmm. And that's kind of a good business model too because sure. you get the recurring yeah. revenue. Yeah. So in the process of that, you know, I've, I've, I've written, I think, 14 books total and done a lot of on, online courses, which are all available at fullfocus.co. And the, the newest course, and you mentioned this trend, was is Life Focus. So I wrote this book with Daniel Harkavy, I think it was in 2015, called Living Forward. And it's my second best-selling book, and it's all about how to create a life plan. And it was basically based on Daniel's methodology, and it was really good. But we found people getting stuck in trying to write a life plan because they, they would say to us, I'm just not a writer. Yeah. The and blank page is scary. Yeah, it is. That blank, right? that blank yeah. page is scary. Yeah. And so we said, how could we gamify this and take the friction out of it and make it really easy? So we created this kit. It has 11 decks of cards. It has one card for core values. One card for your, or one deck for your mission statement, and then nine decks for each of the nine domains of life. So mm -hmm. all you have to do is sort through the cards 
and it has all these prompts and it gets you started. So we took our entire team through it last November with their spouses. They were over the moon, loved it. Mm -hmm. Then we took all of our coaching clients through it in December, a couple hundred of those people. They loved it. Each time, by the way, we're iterating, making improvements. Sure. So we're doing a retreat as we're recording this. We're doing a, a big online virtual retreat this week. Wow. Yeah. So it's Friday and Friday and Saturday. Yeah. But there's there's an online course, there's a kit, all that you can find on our website. But the thing about a life plan, the thing I found is that if you don't design your life, you're gonna drift. That's mm -hmm. the only, that's the only two options, design or drift. And most people are drifting through life. I mean, I'm sure as a financial advisor, Wayne, you meet these people all the time. You know, they're just yeah. hoping for a for a good outcome. But in my experience, nobody ever drifts to a destination they would have chosen. Yeah. It's only bad places. So the countermeasure to that is to design your life and to think, what do I want? And we use a 10-year planning horizon. Where do I want to be in 10 years in my marriage with my kids, with my friends, with my health, with my business? And it becomes a very exciting exercise as people think about the future. And then we, the full focus system, which is embedded in the planner, is designed to help them make incremental progress toward that. Hmm. That's I'd love fantastic. to also circle back to Gail. So we heard about how Michael was missing, crushing it in business, but missing it at home. It would strike me that he's balanced this out, that we've got some integration going here, that we've landed the plane. Would you be able to speak to that a little bit as well? Well, I think the, the biggest... Um, change that he made that had the biggest impact was setting these boundaries. And so uh, later on in his office, so, so he has an office here, which we're in right now, which is in our backyard. It's like a little separate uh, building. And so um, he had it to the point where he would have his computer shut off at six o'clock, his lights would shut off at six o'clock. And it was like, okay, time's up. And, and uh, a few days of that, you, you're like, by the time it gets to be 5.30, you're like, oh my gosh, I've only got 30 minutes left. Mm -hmm. I've got to hurry up and finish all my emails or whatever it is I'm trying to wrap up. Mm -hmm. And so I think that was the biggest change that he made that, that had the biggest uh, difference. And, and then to go on, we got this lake house in 2020. And uh, when he goes there, it, we call him Lake Mike. You know, it's like he's <laughs> he's a different person out at the lake, and he can tinker around with with little projects at the lake house, and um, just be there, sit on the floor with the grandkids and play Monopoly or whatever. He's just he's a different person, and I don't think any of that would have been possible had he not gone through that life planning process and. Mm -hmm. the the coaching with Daniel Harkavy coaching is so crucial to be in a relationship with somebody that can hold you accountable and call out things in your life that that you you want for yourself but you mm -hmm. don't don't want to do the hard work to get there uh get another person involved you know if you want to be a good basketball player you get a good basketball coach or a good mm -hmm. golfing coach or whatever same thing is about life and um so anyway, yeah, I just think that was probably the biggest impact uh, that I saw with him. Mm. That's so good. I um, I think we're, Trent, I'll, I'll preempt you here. I think we're getting towards the end of our time. Um, Michael and Gail, thank you so much for being with us. Um, one final question for you. When we say this is the Envision More podcast. And so when you hear those words, Envision More, what comes to mind for you? Excuse me. I'm <laughs> A couple of things. You know, I wrote a book called The Vision Driven Leader. Mm -hmm. And I think vision is everything. And, you know, I learned from Dr. Covey, begin with the end in mind. And so the fastest way to make progress is get clear on the future. And I, I like what Dan Sullivan says, which I think I quote, quoted earlier, always make your future bigger than your past. Hmm. And that doesn't mean more stuff necessarily. Mm -hmm. You know, I got all right. this stuff. I got more stuff that I can take care of now. Yeah. <laughs> but I want more love. 
more joy, more peace, more family time, more conversations with friends, contribution, uh, better health, you know, all that stuff. And so I think that I, I love the, the name of your podcast because I think it starts, everything starts with vision. It's, the, it's literally the first question I ask my private coaching clients is, what do you want for your future? And mm -hmm. that, as it turns out, that's a hard question to answer. People have a hard time getting clear on what they want. And of course, you know, we've developed tools to help them do that. But that vision, your, your vision of the future will drive everything, or you'll just be in reactive mode and again, drifting. Mm -hmm. So kudos to you guys for such a great name. Thanks. Gail, how about you? Envision more. I don't know what I would add to that, honestly, because um, I agree I agree with what he said, that it all starts with, with visualizing and envisioning a bigger future. And mm -hmm. for me, the older I've gotten, those um, those desires that I have for myself and my life are are way deeper than mm -hmm. I want this particular kind of house or mm -hmm. I want this kind of decor decor or these vacations or you know it's more about who do I want to be and what impact do I want to make in my world and. Yeah. So as I'm envisioning, I just went through the whole life planning process with the new system and these cards, which was so much fun and took so much pressure off. I love the whole process. And when I, when I was articulating my values and my mission statement and my goals and all the things, it all had to do with um, how I can show up in the world and be light and love in this world. And and then to get real practical, okay, what does that actually look like? Where does that show mm -hmm. up? And to really visualize. And, and I will say that even though the, the life planning, uh, the life focus system has a 10-year plan embedded in it, it also has a three-year and a five-year uh, milestone kind of plan in it as well. So you're thinking, okay, where do I want to be three years from now? And how's that going to get me to where I want to be 10 years? And then where would I be in five years? And so it does break it down into, into smaller things. And then going back to the full focus system, you're talking about daily stuff. So that's the beauty of having all of this integrated in itself um, is just that it, it all works together and you really do make progress in the direction you mm -hmm. want to go. And I yeah. just, but it all starts with with having some tool or some process where you're visualizing what you want. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. I have two two final thoughts. One would be on that ten year plan. Uh, I find it uh, uh, I find opportunities to encourage people who are worried about where they are one or two or three years into the journey to remind them of compounded growth. Yes. That, hey, you know, you're you're going to get half your growth in your last two years, your last three years of that 10 year plan. So don't think that you've got to be linear, linearly growing towards where you're going to be in 10 years, because you have to leave room for the compounding based on Gail, what you said, the person you become, mm -hmm. because in order to be, you're ultimately you're setting these goals, but it's the person you become that mm -hmm. is going to bring those in, in the reality. Right. Um, the other thought I would have is I have a, 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 absolutely explosively renewed respect for Michael Hyatt uh, to think about the fact that he went to a man who was the executive secretary for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who had four, she had four older brothers, three of whom were in the military. And that's the conversation. That's the girl he chose to marry the first time he laid eyes on her. That's courage. That's well done. Crazy the most courageous thing you've done in your life, Michael. So we're on you, brother. I was sweating bullets. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I just got to say one funny thing. When he was talking to my dad on the phone and he was saying, you know, I'd like to marry your daughter. And my dad said, you know, we're really excited about the possibility of you coming into our family. And he said that about three or four times. We've got, we're really excited about the possibility. Finally, I said, dad, do we have your blessing or not? Come on. That's great. Dad was injecting that word possibility. Mm -hmm. and maybe, maybe. Not in a, maybe not in a positive place. <laughs> That's great. Good stuff. 
Gail what and Michael, treat, guys. thank you great. so much for joining yes. us here on the Envision More podcast. Um, you're welcome back anytime, but we're just, just so grateful to spend this time with you. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us on. Thank you. We're thrilled about what you're doing. You're doing such important work. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to the Envision More podcast with Wayne Wagner Jr. of Visionary Wealth Management. We hope you were encouraged and inspired by the conversation today. If you want to dig deeper into the show notes or Wayne's work at Visionary, you can find us at envisionmore.com. That's Envision with a Z. Advisory services are provided through Wealth Plan Investment Management. Wealth Plan Investment Management and Visionary Wealth Management are separate entities. The content is developed from sources believed to be providing accurate information. The information in this material is not intended as tax or legal advice. Please consult legal or tax professionals for specific information regarding your individual situation. The opinions and material provided are for general information and should not be considered a solicitation for the purchase or sale of any security. Thanks for listening.